to dampen the spirits of all but the most enthusiastic rowers, the New Zealand Championships are held at Petone, Wellington. First event is the eights, with five crews competing. They leave Petone Beach to row down to the starting point. Mr Carter, the starter, talks the boats into their positions. And then they're on their way, a good start with the Star and West End crews setting the pace. Union Wanganui and West End Auckland take over the lead. The first quarter mile is fast. The boats slice through the calm but dull waters of the harbour. Half the distance gone and Union and West End are fighting it out with Star, North End and Aramo close behind. Union is slamming on the pace with West End meeting them stroke for stroke. And it's Union, West End, West End Union. And across the line with the judge's decision, Union first by only one foot from West End in one of the most exciting finishes in years. And it's back to the start in time to see the single skulls championships. J.R. Hill, 1960 Olympic representative, pulls out in front right from the report of the starter's gun. Up the course and the boats are already spread out with J. Worth second and D. Storey third. Hill rows with confident, easy strokes. He might almost be out on a Sunday afternoon paddle. Hill increases his lead as he nears the finishing markers and crosses the line three lengths ahead of Worth with Storey and Ashley behind him. An hour later, the fours leave the mark and Omaru takes an early lead. Radio commentator Charlie Martin follows the race from the Navy ship, Olford. Omaru is now a length clear of St George with Union closing on them rapidly. Petone, Auckland and North End are just behind. The finishing line is right ahead and the boats are in full cry. Omaru still out front. And Omaru crosses first to win by two lengths from Union with Auckland third. The winners for the major championship trophies have been decided for 1961. Nestling in the landscape of Otago province lies the small township of Lawrence. Many pass through its main street on the way to Queenstown and leave it behind with its memories of a colourful past. For it was here in nearby Gabriel's Gully that a prospector, Gabriel Reed, made the discovery that transformed the valley into a huge sprawling town of tents, huts and claims and brought thousands of gold-hungry miners into the province. Now, a hundred years later, the past has come to life again and once more hundreds are converging on the town of Lawrence. Once more its streets are filled with the sound of men and horses and the gathered crowds watch the pioneers' wagons as they rumble again over once familiar ground. If you were a person of respectable means, you were seen abroad in a vehicle like this. Behind this barrage of pageantry and fun lies a more serious purpose, a recognition of an historical event and of Gabriel Reed, whose discovery yielded the first payable gold in New Zealand. Here, at the site of his first gold strike, the National Historic Places Trust has erected a memorial to Reed, whose honesty in immediately reporting the strike brought new life and business to the province and South Island. The memorial plaque is unveiled by Mrs. McIntosh, the oldest living resident of the district. It's a proud moment as she sees full recognition given to the place that has been her home for 85 years and to Gabriel Reed, whose integrity and determination marked him as one of New Zealand's great pioneers. With a crash of discords, Dunedin gets away to its brightest ever festival. 
But the antics of the clown band and marching girls keep the crowds amused, and for that reason, they're way out in front. It's hats off to beautiful Sally Skeets, Dunedin Festival Queen. But definitely hats on again for the military parade when the 1st Otago Southland Regiment receives the freedom of the city. The Mayor of Dunedin, Mr. Sidey, inspects the parade. Some people just don't seem to realise how serious this all is. I see, is this the London to Brighton? No, but it might well be with the biggest lineup of vintage cars that the city has seen. The Governor General has a look at the ancient entries before the race begins. I say, what a huge rubber band. Official starter Viscount Cobham stands ready to flag away the cars in best Grand Prix tradition. Not all starters planned, and it was going perfectly 50 years ago. Would you like a push? And the way has been cleared for the soapbox derby. There's a big lineup at the post, the weather is fine and the track fast. Hats on or off as you please, and they're away to a push start. What? Backing out already? And here comes the winner. He's a lucky boy. He's got the festival queen complete with crown to give him his prize. But it's crowns off when she visits HMNZS Otago, which is open for inspection. The most recent to be commissioned for New Zealand, Otago was launched in 1960 and has the latest in equipment. Oh, just look at that. I think I'd better... Oh, have you any more of this crazy equipment? Yes, we have, but not on board. It's in the form of the oldest engine on New Zealand railways. Peveril was built in Britain in 1872, and here she is, 90 years later, still beating up the tracks. Fair time at the showgrounds, where the farm has come to town. Some animals are not quite sure they like the idea. Personally, I think all this is rather a lot of wasted time. And what on earth is the point of jumping these fences just to find there's another on the other side? Oh, very good, very good. But make no mistake, some of these horses are champions. Well, that's about the lot. We've enjoyed the festival and there's certainly been a lot to see. Thanks, Dunedin, for a great show. <laughs>